As a kid, I was convinced that I was bionic. And I've got my bionic woman running shoes here to prove it. <laughs> Growing up in Toronto, Canada in the 1970s, I knew I was different. I was a girl who loved science and math. But more importantly, I had con completely convinced my six-year-old self that I was part human, part machine, and 100% awesome. <laughs> For those of you who are old enough to remember, The Bionic Woman Show was a show that aired in the 70s, and it starred a very blonde and very white actress by the name of Lindsay Wagner. At the time, I didn't see any difference between myself and Lindsay Wagner's character, Jamie Summers. We were basically the same person. One day, during kindergarten, I, uh, my bionic skills came in quite in ha handy. I used to love running to the jungle gym and climbing up some monkey bars that must have been all of five feet high. One such day, I scaled those monkey bars with my first ever kindergarten crush. Let's call him Steve Austin. <laughs> Steve and I climbed those monkey bars, and we were enjoying our view of all the non-bionic children in the playground when all of a sudden, Steve leapt from the top of those bars down to the ground. I motioned to follow him in this amazing feat of agility and strength when he yelled to me to stop. I asked him why. He said that as bionic man, he could make that jump, but that as bionic woman, I was not strong enough and I would never be able to make it. And so I leapt. Good God, I leapt. I took a leap of faith And as soon as I landed and was able to steady myself, I made my way over to my first ever crush, and I started to pummel poor Steve Austin. <laughs> How dare he say that I, Jamie freaking Summers, was not as strong as Bionic Man. Our kindergarten teacher rushed over to us and pulled me away from my out-of-character behavior and said, why, Devilino, why are you punching this poor little boy? I told her, he said, that bionic woman was not as strong as bionic man. I think she was sympathetic, but I really still got in trouble. <laughs> that day I learned an important lesson, that being a girl and being a bionic girl at the same time was going to be tricky. Another day that same winter, I was making my way home when all of a sudden, a snowball pelted me in the back of the head. When I turned around to see where the snowy assault was coming from and who the perpetrator was, I saw a tall eighth grade boy with blonde hair and blue eyes getting ready to throw another snowball at me. And as he was doing so, he yelled the word Packy. More snowballs kept coming and he kept yelling this word Packy at me over and over again. I don't know what the word Packy meant and I don't know why he was throwing snowballs at me, but what I did know is that thanks to my bionic legs, I was going to be able to get away from this bad guy. And so, I motored my way home. And when I got home, I opened the door, and with tears running down my face, I told my mother what had happened. I asked her, what does this word packy mean? She sighed. And she said, it's a mean word, used to refer to people from Pakistan. That must have been hard for her. It must have been hard to explain to a six-year-old that people were going to be mean to me just because of the color of my skin. I hadn't paid much attention to the color of my skin at that point. I was more interested in the anodes and diodes and bionic parts that were underneath my skin. As far as I knew, I was Canadian. My parents were from India, but they were also Canadian. But this early experience with racism taught me another important lesson. Not only was it going to be difficult to be a bionic girl, But being a brown bionic girl on top of that was going to be downright difficult. I believe that every instance that I've had or encounter that I've had that has questioned my abilities or my potential because of my presumed biological sex or that has made me feel inadequate because of the brown color of my skin has actually motivated me to think very seriously about questions of difference. Becoming a molecular biologist actually taught me that biology isn't something that should be used against a person for who they are. 
Now, as a professor of neuroscience and behavioral biology with a joint appointment in women's gender and sexuality studies, I get to bring my love of science together with my commitment to social justice issues every day. I get to use my interdisciplinary expertise to create new conversations between feminism and science. My years of research has led me to an important uh, conclusion. To address the difference and diversity issue in STEM, we need to do more than just have more women and minorities enter into the sciences. We actually need more feminists in science. And when I say this, I should be clear. Anyone can be a feminist. A woman, a man, bionic, non-bionic, all are welcome. So let's look at some data around diversity issues in STEM. In the 2019 National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics report on women, minorities, and persons with disabilities, we can actually see that there has been some improvement in some areas since the NSF started collecting this data. For example, in the biological sciences, women now hold the majority of degrees. And in fact, 52.6% of all doctoral degrees in the biological sciences are now awarded to women. When the NSF started collecting this data 35 years ago, this number was at 30%. So yes, we can definitely say that in this particular field, there's been some improvement. However, the report also shows that over the last two decades, there's actually been a decline in the number of women receiving bio, uh, bachelor's degrees in mathematics and in statistics. And in the computer sciences, there's also been a decline and uh, less women receiving bachelor's degrees. So, interestingly, Leo, there's in the field where, in biological sciences, where there are a majority of women receiving degrees, we see an interesting phenomenon. Even though 52.6% of all doctoral degrees are awarded to women, only 42% of assistant professors are women. And tenured associate professors, this number goes down to 35%. And at the full professor level, only 26% of those positions held are held by women. Many refer to this issue as the pipeline issue, or the leaky pipeline problem. Others say that innate biological and psychological differences between women and men is actually the cause behind why women can't prosper as much in sciences. Now, I'm not interested in using or engaging with either of these arguments. I think that the pipeline metaphor and evolutionary psychology-based arguments have actually grown quite stale. I know that it's important for us to address gender discrimination in the scientific workplace, and I think that there are many qualified individuals who are doing so. But what I also think is that we need a fresh way to look at this issue. In order to support women and minorities, in STEM fields, I think we need to go beyond just counting heads and see who gets to become a scientist. In order to support diversity in STEM, we also have to interrogate how it is that we do science. This means that we have to take the time to reflect on which questions are being asked in science, who gets to ask these questions, and what gets to count as scientific knowledge. Well, how do we go about doing this? Well, it turns out that feminists have been working on putting together a toolkit that allows us to think about questions of diversity and difference in more creative ways. Certainly in more creative ways than a pipeline metaphor or color-coded brains allows us to. In fact, this toolkit is a game changer. As a feminist scientist, I have used this toolkit. And now I know that the term feminist is actually a loaded one, and that feminism means many things to many different people. But this toolkit did expand my ideas of what feminism offers and what it means to be a feminist. It actually allowed me to think 
differently about the concept of difference. It allowed me to think about difference not as a lack or as a mutation from a norm. And it has encouraged me to question how it is that we establish our norms. It has also encouraged me to interact with the world in a way where I learn to think with and learn with those who are, who are typically marginalized in our societies. Since at least the 1960s and 1970s, when all kinds of social and civil rights movements were happening around the world, feminists started developing this toolkit. And they used it mostly to debunk those uh, ideas and those scientific ideas as well that are used to actually discriminate against people because of their sex, their gender, their race, their class, and other categories. Feminist scientists have been using elements of this toolkit and applying it to the scientific method. Feminist scientists aren't interested in dismissing science or dismantling science. Rather, they want to produce scientific knowledge that is more meaningful and speaks more directly to the lives and the material conditions of people who are typically marginalized. So let's look at some of the tools in this toolkit. The first one I'm going to share with you, it's called feminist standpoint theory. Feminist standpoint theory encourages the scientist to originate their questions from the perspectives of from the margins and to include those viewpoints that aren't usually included. It encourages a scientist to ask, where did my research question originate? Who will this research benefit? And have I taken into account the needs and the concerns of those whose lives that will be most impacted by this research? Another tool in this toolkit is situated knowledges. Situated knowledges invites the scientist to reorient themselves to the experimental design, the experimental apparatus, and to their object of knowledge. It encourages the scientist to ask, does this scientific experiment assume that the scientist can have a view from nowhere? Does this experiment make an accommodation for the fact that there might be experimental biases embedded in this inquiry? And it asks, can the scientist recognize that there might be some kind of connection or relation with their object of study? Another tool in this toolkit is called Nature Cultures. And this one's actually come in quite handy for me. Nature Cultures asks us to think about difference differently, not in just in terms of a dichotomy or a binary. It forces the scientists to ask in their inquiry, am I reinstating a type of binary that's based on a division between biology and culture, or nature and nurture? Is my inquiry reinforcing essentialist kind of thinking or reductionism? And is my inquiry actually repeating gendered or hierarchical paradigms? It's these tools that actually encouraged me to become a scientist in the first place. When I started my PhD in molecular biology and reproductive neuroendocrinology, I made sure to be informed by feminist health advocates and reproductive justice advocates in Toronto. These advocates were interested in knowing what were the long-term effects of hormone-based contraceptives and hormone-based therapies on women's bodies. And so I jumped at the chance to participate in an experiment that was led by my PhD supervisor who, by the way, happened to be one of the very few female faculty in our department. In this experiment, we asked a question that had not yet been asked. In this experiment, we asked, are estrogen receptors located in a certain neuron of the brain? We were specifically looking at whether or not estrogen receptors were located in what is known as the gonadotropin-releasing hormone neuron located in the hypothalamus. These neurons, also referred to as GNRH neurons, are known to play an important role in the regulation of reproduction. For decades, however, expert neuroendocrinologists had determined that GNRH neurons 
actually didn't express estrogen or androgen receptors. They had been using a hierarchical paradigm to understand the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. And in this model, the brain sends the commands down to the gonads. There was no room to understand that there might be feedback mechanisms from the gonads up to the brain. My PhD work showed that, in fact, GnRH neurons do express estrogen receptors, and that these uh, receptors are active, and that they can change GnRH synthesis. This finding actually has broad impacts, because it tells us that estrogen-based contraceptives or hormone replacement therapies don't just target the gonads, they might actually add directly at the level of the brain and have an influence on our reproductive cycles, on our sleep cycles, and more. Using a feminist toolkit actually led me to search for estrogen receptors in GnRH neurons. Conducting scientific experimentation actually made me understand that our molecules, our genes, our proteins, our cells, our brains, our bodies, what they can do, our understanding of what they can do, can actually change. In fact, molecular biology taught me that our biologies and our destinies are not fixed. Reimagining how we think about difference in the sciences might actually invite more women and minorities to enter into and to stay in the sciences. It might give them the courage to ask questions that aren't usually asked. It might give them the courage to produce scientific knowledge that actually ma matters more to their lives and to the material conditions of their lives. And even if you're not bionic, Using science and the wonders of science might take you to another place as a woman or as a minority. And I hope this can work for all of us. Thank you.